So for me, this has become a primary issue because if we don't have free speech, then we can't take the actions we need to protect people from addiction and homelessness, take actions to protect the natural environment, also to protect our prosperity. We can't have a functioning democracy or free markets without free speech. But even more fundamentally than that, we can't be fully human. Right. You know, like right. you're... My view is that if you don't have freedom of speech, then you're not you're not truly a human being. Right. You have to be able to express your ideas, however wrong and stupid they might be. And let's face it, half the time we are wrong, and we don't know we're wrong if we can't talk about it. Right. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the What Is Money Show. I am thrilled to have you here joining me on my mission to help shine light on the corruption of money. Now, if this is your first time listening to the What Is Money Show, I strongly recommend that you go back to episodes one through nine first, which lays a lot of the groundwork for many of the concepts that we explore on the show. These first nine episodes are my series with Michael Saylor and Thousands of people have told me that this is the best podcast series they've ever heard, hands down, and that it was instrumental to their understanding of money and Bitcoin. So if you're looking to start a deep dive into the nature of money, I don't think there's any place better that you can start other than episode one of this show. Now, a little bit about this show and how it makes money. The What Is Money show is 100% sponsor based. So all of our revenues are derived from direct sponsorships. And I strive to be very selective about the sponsors that I work with, specifically only using sponsors that I use personally, and also choosing sponsors that have values which are well aligned to the values expressed on this show, such as freedom, education, self-sovereignty, etc. So what I'm going to do now is a few ad reads right at the top of the show, and then I'll do a few more ad reads in the middle. And I hope you'll take the time to listen to them, as again, these are hand-selected sponsors, and I think you'll like what they have to offer. Today's podcast is brought to you by N. Wolf's Clothing. Wolf is the first startup accelerator dedicated exclusively to the Bitcoin Lightning Network. Four times per year, Wolf brings teams from around the world to New York City to work with like-minded entrepreneurs, pushing the boundaries of what's possible with Bitcoin and Lightning. The program is designed to help early-stage companies achieve product market fit, develop their brand, secure early-stage funding, and grow businesses that help fuel the global adoption of Bitcoin. So go to wolfnyc.com to learn more about the program or apply. Again, that's WolfNYC, W-O-L-F-N-Y-C dot com. Michael Schellenberg, welcome to the What Is Money show. Good to be with you, Robert. It's great to have you here. Uh, we are at ARC, the inaugural ARC event here in London, um, actually towards the end. It's been a very inspiring and insightful event. I don't know how have you enjoyed it. You also spoke and presented here. I don't know if you were able to catch much of the programming. Well, it's very exciting. Yeah, I think it shows a lot of the 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 ferment on the right politically and and what does it mean to be a conservative and it's exciting to see that happening. Yeah, definitely uh nice to see the counter move to the World Economic Forum. So yes. push. So that's good. Uh just by way of quick introduction before we dive in, you're a best selling author. Uh you've written books like Apocalypse Never and San Francisco. Uh you're also a journalist and the founder of Public, which is a Substack publication. Um, a lot of what you cover, I think what you also spoke about at the event here was environmental hysteria, I would call it. Um, and I'm not sure, this is probably in your book, Apocalypse Never, I'm guessing. What is it about environmental alarmism that is harming us? And then what, what do you, I guess, what is the causative factors underneath it. Sure. Well, I think there's, it's important to start by saying there are real environmental problems. I believe climate change is real. I think it's mostly caused by human beings. It is something that I worry about. I've worked on it for over 25 years, but it's not the most important environmental problem in the world. And it's certainly not the end of the world. And most people don't realize that carbon emissions globally have actually been flat over the last decade. Mm -hmm. Part of that is due to the fact that there's been less land use change than people thought. Part of it is due that we've been making a switch from coal to natural gas, which produces half the carbon emissions as coal. 
And the reason I don't think climate change is the most important environmental problem in the world is in part because we're doing such a good job both mitigating it by reducing carbon emissions and adapting to it. Our infrastructure is so much better than it was 50, 100 years ago. So if you look at a photograph of Miami Beach 100 years ago, there weren't nearly as many buildings on it, and those buildings weren't nearly as sophisticated or robust as today's infrastructure. So for me, the number one environmental problem in the world remains frontier agriculture because it brings rainforest destruction. It's often brutal forms of agriculture for the people that are engaged in it. That threatens habitat for endangered species. I think we've lost sight of the importance of that issue, in part because it's out of sight, out of mind. But on all, so many other issues, we've just made huge amounts of environmental progress. Conventional pollutants have declined enormously. I mean, 99% decline in lead in the air. Our water is clean. I mean, you travel around the world and the vast majority of countries, you can drink the water out of the tap and it's clean. So I think we've lost sight of all the progress we've made and that much of the alarmism that we've seen really has nothing to do with the state of the environment, has to do with the state of the mental environment. And that's what's deteriorated so much over the last several decades. Is there any psyop component to this? Like there are certain groups in the world that would benefit from climate hysteria, uh, specifically as, let's say, a blank check to print money. I think I saw the Green New Deal they wanted to print $100 trillion over 50 years to fund the Green New Deal. Is there any component of that in this, in this environmental alarmism? There definitely is. I, I've identified three main components of the drivers, the motivations of environmental alarmism. It's money, power, and ideology, or really religion, a kind of apocalyptic environmental religion. The money, it's every, everybody knows and everybody sees it. I mean, as we had $369 billion in the Inflation Reduction Act, which passed last year. They now think it's going to be a trillion dollars in costs if it's allowed to continue as it was planned, mostly for so-called renewable energy companies, solar producers, wind companies. There's also a kind of drive for power, which you can see at the individual level, you know, people like Greta Thunberg or AOC or others gaining power, but also the European Union has used climate hysteria to demand greater power at an international level. The United Nations has done this. The World Economic Forum. These are all folks have used it to gain kind of personal and social and political power. Royalty, like you know Prince Harry and Meghan Markle, who are really not very important people. They're not very relevant. They've used it as a way to gain, you know, to demoralize. And then the spiritual part of it. I mean, if you look at the traditional Judeo-Christian story, which is that we all lived in harmony. And then we ate from the fruit of knowledge, and then we fell, and then the world is going to come to an end because of our sins against God. It's just the same story, but they substitute nature for God, and the priests are the scientists. The idea is that we lived in a state of harmony with nature until, well, depending on who you're talking to, but until the invention of modern agriculture or the use of fossil fuels. Some people pinpoint the fall to nuclear, and that the world is coming to an end, unless we get right by nature or harmonize with nature. We used to say, you have to get right by God to prevent the end of the world from coming. So it's almost a one-to-one -one substitute of this eco-apocalyptic religion for what used to be Judeo-Christian religion. And it's notable that in places like Japan or South Korea, where they haven't had that Judeo-Christian tradition, they don't have as strong of an eco-apocalyptic point of view. They have more of an ancestor uh, you know, worshiping mythologies. So I think that ultimately what environmental alarmism has taken hold is because of a spiritual vacuum that's existed as belief in God and traditional religion and the soul and the afterlife have all declined. And that's been happening really for at least 150 years in the West, but it's accelerated over the last several decades. So I think that's what's driving it. So the final chapter in Apocalypse Never is called False Gods for Lost Souls. So, and when I'm being generous, I think that the people that are the most hysterical are are spiritually, are spiritual seekers. There's yeah. the lost souls trying to find meaning and purpose in the world. We have so many of our basic material needs met. Mm -hmm. You know, we're so much wealthier than our parents or grandparents or great grandparents were. And when you've got those basic material needs net met, then you're looking for other sources of meaning and purpose. Right. So fascinating. So is the correspondence between, uh, let's say, the you know, 
the wrath of God, the fear of the wrath of God, and now the fear of the wrath of nature. Is that an intentional fabrication, do you think? That the, this climate alarmism narrative has been structured to uh, map on to what people were already programmed for? I, I think it's unintentional. Okay. I think it's mostly unconscious. I mean, we know from, whatever, 150 years of philosophy or 50 years of psychology that we're strangers to ourselves, as Friedrich Nietzsche says, or that we dream while we're awake and that we have much baser motivations for, you know, if you believe Nietzsche, for sort of personal power and, yeah, and a desire, not necessarily to control others, but also to feel like we're important, that our lives are meaningful, that something about our lives will live on after we die. Mm -hmm. Some of this is a beautiful thing, which is that we want to have a legacy. We want to feel like our lives matter. And, and I think that's perfectly acceptable. I think the problem is that when you're unconscious to your own desires, or even when you deny that you want personal power or some sense of immortality, then it creeps itself into the back door. So when you interview people and you say, you say, there's a lot of people, if you ask them, what's your faith? And they'll say, you know, I'm a Christian or I'm a Jew or a Muslim or I'm a Hindu. Or you might say, you know, I don't believe in God, but I believe in, you know, rationality. There is still sort of a, a spiritual sense of immortality. Whereas if you say, no, I have no religion, I'm not religious, you know, often what I see with folks like that is that the religion creeps in the back door and then they end up expressing religious ideas in supposedly secular ways. Sure. Climate change being one of them. Yes. No, that's, that's very true. Um, I love the example Peterson always gives of the atheists rocking out at a concert saying they're showing they're having basically a religious experience at a concert. Um, yeah, there's just this idea that knowledge has limitations, right? And we need some term for that, which is beyond words in a way. And, um, you know, God historically was that. Now we're sort of plugging it with nature. But I guess higher power kind of, that's right, fits the, the bill, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Now you said that there's a lot of accurate climate and environmental data available. Uh, and it's available widely at this point. So what is it? Why do people keep misrepresenting the truth about this data if it's widely available and it's accurate? Well, that's a great question. You know, I think it gets back to these motivations that are often blind to people. We see it all the time. I mean, if I, when I confront people with this information, they'll find that are alarmists, they'll find ways to dismiss it. I, I, for example, was personally censored on Facebook for sharing accurate information. So I said in my book and the promotional materials for it, I, in 2020, I said, you know, natural disasters are getting better, not worse. You know, what did I mean by that? Well, I meant that deaths from natural disasters have declined over 90%, even as the population quadrupled over the last century. And the cost of disasters, when you account for more wealth and harm's way, has also declined because our infrastructure is so much better. The result is actually that what gets counted as a natural disaster has declined because disasters are not the same thing as extreme weather events. They're just deaths and costs. And Facebook censored it. And what they said was they said it's misleading. Well, that's their way of saying it's true, but they worry that people would be less alarmist when they learn this information. This is uh, a, a trick that's been developed by people that are demanding censorship, which is that, well, yeah, what you said is true, but but it, it risks you doing things that I don't like. So we saw Facebook censored people for sharing stories, true stories of vaccine side effects from the COVID vaccine side effects, because they worried that it would lead people to not take the vaccine. So you've suddenly, this is very Orwellian, where we're saying, okay, maybe it's accurate, but it's it's dangerous. I think when you get into a situation where people are censoring the truth because they think it's dangerous, you've got yourself in a totalitarian society. And, yeah. and, and we'll, we'll get to censorship later, I know, but but that's, I think, been, been what's going on, is that people fear the truth because it won't allow them to control the population in the ways that they are when they keep them in a state of fear. Yeah, that's extremely scary. So even anything that counters the narrative risk censorship, even if it's true. Uh, also, my experience was even if it's just funny or mean. So my censorship occurred when I shared a meme of Greta Thunberg holding a sign 
that said, uh, climate change or the weather is always your fault and the answer is always more communism. <laughs> and I just retweeted it with laughing emojis. Right. And I was censored for that. Wow. On tw- on pre Elon Twitter? Well, it was on Twitter. It was on Twitter, but we reposted to Instagram and Instagram censored it and said it's false information. I'm like, where the- how do you fact check that? It's a meme. It's a joke. Like, I don't know. Anyways, very silly. I mean, it, it's a reminder of what it was like under communism, where, you know, communism under like, left under communism was not hospitable to comedy. Yeah. It's it's probably one of the signs that you're slipping into totalitarian society sure. when you're when you're not tolerating satire and yeah. humor, which are sort of part of being alive, yeah. is appreciating language and you know, language is not strictly representational. You know, there's some things like, you know, the glass on the table is representation. I say the word glass. Yeah. But so many other things like jokes and whatnot, they're not they're not representing things in the world, they're representing ideas. So I think there's a rigidity. And that's based in a kind of fear of losing control that's behind that will to censorship. That's absolutely right. Yeah, the comedians are at the edge of freedom of speech, right? They're saying the things that are almost risky or taboo to say, getting people to laugh. And that's right. I'm reminded too where you should always fear the king that kills the court jester. Right. right? Because he's becoming totalitarian, right? That's right. Yeah, a king who can't take a, a good ribbing, yeah. you know, a, a being poked fun at. I mean, that's what happened with Babylon B when it got censored by by Twitter, right? Or we got deplatformed by Twitter for making a joke. So I think that was an early warning sign. And certainly that was one of the things that led Elon Musk to want to buy the platform. Yeah, yeah, very scary stuff. If you are a business owner or manager, you should know these three numbers. 36,000, 25, and 1. 36,000 is the number of businesses that have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, which allows you to streamline accounting, financial management, human resources, and more. NetSuite turns 25 years old this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days rather than weeks, and to drive down cost. And finally, one, because your business is one of a kind. So with NetSuite, you get a customized solution for all your key performance indicators in one efficient system with one source of truth. NetSuite is everything you need all in one place. Right now, you can download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance absolutely free at netsuite.com slash whatismoney. That's netsuite.com slash whatismoney to get your free KPI checklist. Again, netsuite.com slash what is money. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, iCoin Technology. iCoin has just released a sleek new hardware wallet. Looks like a mini iPhone, a little touch screen and camera on it. Uh, the device has no Wi-Fi, no cellular connection, no GPS. It's a strictly physically cold hardware wallet. Uh, like I said, it's got a high-res 3-inch touch screen. It's got a camera for air gapping the wallet. Uh, It's got optional Bluetooth compatibility, and it's really a a brand new UI, UX experience for a hardware wallet, making it very accessible, easy to use, not intimidating. And as we always talk about on this show, the only way you can truly own your Bitcoin is by having it in self-custody. So you need a device like iCoin Wallet to truly own your Bitcoin. Go to iCoinTechnology.com today and use promo code BITCOIN23 for 30% off of this new sleek hardware wallet. Okay, another area of your work that you focus on is drugs, crime, and homelessness. Maybe we could start with homelessness. What What is it this really about? Um a lot of people, like, and I shared with this with you offline that, like, I think the printing of money actually causes the monetization of real estate, right? People are looking to store purchasing power in something. The currency doesn't work. So, what's the next best thing? Commodities, real estate, equities, et cetera. So, it, it, it imparts this monetary premium into alternative asset classes. And my theory, and not my theory, but theory that's been circled in, in economic spheres is that this actually contributes to homelessness. It probably some people out of homes. What, are, what is your opinion about homelessness? What are the primary drivers of this? Um, and I guess, what can we do about it? Sure. Well, I mean, I should say, I, I, I think we, I agree with you on, on the point about the housing. And I think we need more housing. And I'm also disturbed by the sheer quantity of housing that is 
doesn't have any people in it that's being held as a, as you were saying as an asset. I'm not sure how to solve that. It's a really interesting and important problem. But the people that are living on the streets, you know, overwhelmingly are folks that are in, are mentally ill or addicted. You know, if you lose your job or you're down on your luck, people move in with friends and family, or they move to a different city where they can afford the where they can afford the rent, or they'll even, you know, worst case scenario, go live in a in a shelter. You know, they'll accept shelter. You know, the proverbial mother, you know, fleeing the abusive husband with her two kids. We do a pretty good job of taking care of her at this point. You don't find a lot of people like her on the street. What you find on the street are folks that are addicted to hard drugs or, or schizophrenic or have some other untreated mental illness. It's an issue that I care a lot about. I, you know, I have three friends from high school that became homeless addicts. Two of them are dead. Um, my aunt had schizophrenia. Um, she had pretty good outcomes. She lived in a group home. Mm-hmm. It's not super complicated about how to take care of folks. You know, most people don't do drugs. The people that most people that do drugs don't get become addicted. Most people who become addicted are able to quit on their own or after an intervention with friends and family. And there's just a small percentage of people who, after confronted with their addiction, they you know they lose their jobs, they lie, steal, and cheat from their family and friends. They end up on the street. These are the most difficult people to deal with. And they need an intervention by the society. We, we've known for 150 years how to deal with addiction, which is that you need an, an intervention, you need treatment, and you need re- uh, long-term recovery. That's the process of rehabilitation. The reason that we see these open drug scenes, which are basically open-air drug markets for very hard, intense drugs. I mean, people have to appreciate, I mean, fentanyl makes heroin look mild in comparison. Fentanyl is 50 to 100 times more potent than heroin. Today's meth is much stronger than the speed that people were taking in the 60s. These are very difficult drugs to quit. And so the open drug scene, which get misnamed homeless homeless encampments, they're formed because the addicts who go there to buy the drugs are so addicted that they, when as soon as they buy the drugs, they use them right there on the spot. Like if you hang out, you watch people, they buy the drugs and they shoot the drugs or they smoke the drugs right there. And then they live there right near the dealers. And and so the word homelessness and homeless encampment are really propaganda words designed to trick your brain into thinking that this is a problem of high rents when it's clearly a problem of, of really hardcore addiction. Requires an intervention and requires that when people break the law, that they're arrested and given the choice between jail and treatment. And, you know, it, it's funny, it just shows how I think lost people are on this issue, that that sounds harsh to people. But when you interview people, addicts in recovery, including f- formerly homeless addicts, they'll tell you, they said, look, I had to be arrested. I was out of control. If I hadn't been arrested, I probably would have died on the street. And that's what we see, you know, one to two people dying on the street every day in San Francisco. Uh, many more than that in Los Angeles, but Seattle, Portland, Denver, you know, any, any of the, any of the big cities on the West coast, we're seeing, uh, really what is a, what I think it, what should be called a street addiction crisis. So it requires an intervention via arrest, and then they need to either be put in jail or put in treatment. What is the success rate on it? Do you know, like, how effective are these interventions currently? Is there anything we can do to improve them? Addiction is an extremely difficult psychiatric disorder. It's one of the reasons that you need to, we need to make sure that we prevent our kids from, you know, really even experimenting with any of these hard drugs. You know, the Dutch are, who I see as having been successful on this, they split off marijuana. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, from other hard drugs, you know, the number of people that overdose on marijuana is zero. Mm -hmm. So, you know, alcohol is a much more dangerous drug than than marijuana. And some people use marijuana as an alternative to alcohol. Um, uh, Marijuana itself has become much more potent. So the Dutch have actually put potency limits on the marijuana. So you can buy lower potency marijuana. There's also limited places to buy it in the Netherlands. They still have trouble, but they manage it. Um... You know, it's it's a challenge. You know, most addicts relapse, and that's part of recovery. That's generally recognized as part of the recovery is that addicts relapse. You don't give up on them. But certainly, if you don't have the intervention, then, then they're lost. And so it really depends. That, you know, uh, one interesting study that was done of the, the people that recover the quickest from addiction are medical doctors. Hmm. They're, you know, medical doctors... 
you know, they have access to a lot of drugs. And so it's not a lot of medical doctors, um, you know, but there are some amount of medical doctors every year that become addicted to hard drugs. They, with an intervention, they're, they're more like they're, they're, they have fewer relapses. And that's in large part to the fact that medical doctors have something really big to lose if they don't quit, which is their medical license. So you always need to have a carrot and a stick. You need to have some consequence for bad behavior, and then you need to have some reward for good behavior. For many homeless people, and this has been proven in study after study over 40 years, it's often just the chance to get a private room in a shelter rather than being in congregate shelter where you're with all these other people. People love their privacy. So we discovered, they discovered in, in research in Birmingham, first you got to get the homeless folks off the streets. It's not safe on the streets. You can't recover on the streets. You come into a homeless shelter and the first thing that people want is they want their own private room. If you pass a drug test, you can have your own room. If you fail the drug test, you're not going to go back on the street, but you'll go back to congregate shelter. And that's usually the incentive they need. But, you know, it's also if you're mentally ill, it sort of follows the same pattern, but in reverse, you need to take your meds so you don't become psychotic. And if you take your meds and you and your behavior improves, then you get a private room. And eventually, you know, if you're just a 25-year-old heroin or fentanyl or meth addict on the streets, uh, you know, your chances of recovery are much better than if you're a 70 year old, um, heroin or, or, and I think that's why the intervention is so important to make letting 25 year olds become 30 and 35 and 40 year olds on the streets. It's, uh, making the situation for them much more difficult and making them much less likely that they're going to be able to recover. Right. You know, we see stenosis now among uh, people that are, uh, that have been opioid addicts for a long time. So they become hunchbacks, you know, so you get young men in their, you know, late twenties or thirties, if they've been using opioids for a decade or more, they become hunched over, you know, their backs are basically wow. curvature. So you see people in, it's from the drugs. It's, the drugs. Wow. it's miss it's, it's often, there's a source of misinformation where, where people that do not want to intervene will suggest that, oh, no, they were handicapped before they came on the street. Actually, it's the the, the long-term usage of hard opioid drugs that results in those in the, in the spinal curvature. My goodness. What, where do we draw the line between... I mean, obviously, what you're describing here is a lot of hardcore drug addiction, addiction to hard drugs. But as you said earlier, there's a lot of people that use drugs recreationally, never become addicted... Where where does the line between I guess recreational use or maybe even therapeutic use and addiction like where how do you, I guess how do you define the nature of addiction? Yeah, for me, if you're using heroin or meth or some other hard drug in the privacy of your own home and you're not breaking any other laws, I think that you're crazy. You yeah. shouldn't do that. Right. We should warn against it. Right. But I don't think that should be a priority for law enforcement. Right. You, for me, if you're breaking some other law, you're camping and you're you know camping illegally, you're using drugs publicly, or public defecation, or or engaging in theft or violence. There's often a lot of petty theft to fund people's addiction. Then you should be arrested for those crimes, brought before a judge, evaluated for your psychiatric care, and offered a choice about whether you'd rather serve time in jail without. Uh, a substitute opioid like mm -hmm. methadone or suboxone or whether you'd rather go to rehab. In fact, you could do it right there on the streets. You know, the idea that we had is that, you know, if you're, if you're, if you've overdosed on the street, we revive you. There should be a nurse or social worker along with a police officer. And they can say to you, they can say, you know, Robert, this is the 10th time we've revived you or the 20th time we've revived you from an overdose. It's very expensive, by the way. Have the whole fire truck and ambulance come out. Mm -hmm. um, we can get you into rehab right now and get you on a Suboxone taper so that you don't have withdrawals. Or Officer Garcia here, my colleague, will take you to jail and you can kick in jail without any treatment. Which would you rather have? Give people the choice right there on the spot. Get them into the care they need. There's no need for this... You know, I mean, you can go to the courthouse and you go to jail or whatever, but people want, will often choose the treatment and the care and then go do the 90 or 180 days in rehab, mm -hmm. get you back on your life path off of drugs, out of the open air drug scene. So for me, that's the line is that you're really not arresting people for being addicted. I don't think that addiction itself needs to be criminalized. 
but breaking the law and right. and right. In, in enforcing laws, you know, it needs to happen both because you can't have a society where everybody's breaking the law all the time, sure. but also because that's often how how addicts get care is right. by breaking. In fact, when you interview many many addicts I've interviewed, they will say they will say that they started they were so desperate in their addiction, so just at the end of their ropes that they would actually find crimes to commit and kind of find a way to get caught, mm-hmm. sort of semi consciously doing things that where they were careless sort of deliberately in the hopes of getting caught and getting, getting some control over their lives. It's incredible. So the line then is kind of the crime, right? Actually, when you're out harming other people to fuel your addiction. That's right. Um, I do think there should also, like there should be public education campaigns. There should be campaigns to encourage the intervention by family and friends. Uh, but yeah, I just think Look, you don't want the police. You don't want a police state where the police are are kicking you know indoors. kicking in doors for addicts. But usually, addi- yeah. you know, addiction usually spiral. You know, you know, not always, but sometimes can spiral out of control yeah. and result in law breaking. And then that's a chance for the intervention that they're crying out for. Yeah, that makes sense, right? If you're just doing the damage to yourself, well, then kind of a personal matter. But once that damage gets outside of yourself, then someone needs to. I mean, I always say I'm a liberal in my compassion for the vulnerable. I'm a libertarian in my love of freedom, and I'm a conservative in that I think you need civilization to protect both of those things. So the libertarian part of me says, yeah, I don't want the police, you know, abusing their powers. At the same time, you know, you have to have, the sidewalks have to be safe to walk on, and you have to have safe cities, and that means you have to enforce the laws. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. What, in your estimation, is the relationship between someone's socioeconomic status and the possibility of mental illness or addiction. Like obviously, if you've had a rough go of it, let's say you've lost your job, you've lost your wife, whatever the thing may be, you're maybe more likely. I don't know actually if if you develop mental illness or if that's nature nurture, I'm not sure, but addiction is obviously something you could nurture, right? What is the relationship, if any, between socioeconomics and uh, proclivity for mental illness or addiction? Yeah, I mean, there's no question that uh, that people that are more vulnerable to particularly street addiction uh, come from you know poor, more working class backgrounds. So it's not always the case. There's often a lot more middle class kids on the street than you might think. But one example, um, you know, that I always think about is you know the Summer of Love, San Francisco, 1967. We remember it as really about acid, LSD, and marijuana. And we think of it as sort of an upper middle class phenomenon. A bunch of college kids from Yale and Harvard and you know Berkeley, they hang out in Golden Gate Park in that summer. The summer ends, those kids go back to college, get on with their lives, and they may still dabble in marijuana for the rest of their lives, but they're in control. These are the elites. They're in control of their lives. They're wealthier. They're educated. What we know about that period is that the working class kids who, who were left behind, who did not return to college in the fall, got addicted to speed, got addicted to heroin, and became sort of the first homeless. Mm. You know, similarly, when we think the 80s, when the homelessness problem really first shows up, it's really a combination of the mentally ill that had been let out of psychiatric hospitals that had been abruptly closed without a proper alternative, and uh, people that were addicted to crack, and usually crack and alcohol. It's a very famous joke, you know, which is, you know, um, what's the best part of drinking? You know, the cocaine. Um, So... Is really uh, we remember it as a crack epidemic, but it's often a co- an alcohol and, and cocaine epidemic. And then I mentioned that story earlier about doctors. So part of it is that there's I think two factors going on. Wealthier people have more to lose than poor people from their addiction. But the second is just that there's a background factor which psychologists call internal locus of control or external locus of control. You know, you and me, we have a very strong internal locus of control, meaning we have a lot of belief that we can overcome adversity in our circumstances. There's other people that don't have that. So when you interview, there's famous studies where they interview the poor and they'll and that have maybe committed crimes, and they'll describe the crimes in a kind of passive tense. So there's a very famous book um, named after this, but the a psychologist was interviewing a guy that had just stabbed his girlfriend to death. And what he says is, he says, the knife went in. He didn't say, I stabbed my girlfriend with a knife. He wasn't taking responsibility for it. It was the knife went in as though it was some ghost or some spirit that was doing it. That's very typical of the way 
when you interview people on the street, when they describe why they're on the street, they don't talk about, well, I made this terrible decision and, you know, I didn't go, you know, I decided to party too much or, you know, I did, I did this or I did that. I chose my addiction over my family. They describe themselves as victims of their circumstances. And so, and th that's already a problem, but then what you have in progressive cities like San Francisco and Los Angeles and Seattle and Portland is you have victimhood ideology that emerges. Victimhood ideology says, instead of saying, hey, maybe you've been victimized, but you can overcome your circumstances. We'll help, but ultimately you have the power. Think of you know Tony Robbins. You have the power to overcome your circumstances. Instead, victimhood ideology says you're a victim and there's nothing you can do about it because the system is corrupt. And so you're permanently a victim. And to victims, everything should be given and nothing required. So all we should do is make it easier and safer, supposedly safer, for you to support your addiction rather than for you to have an intervention, go through treatment, get rehabilitation, and get on with a, a proper healthy life. Uh, so the lack of self-responsibility, right? And I guess it would be this external locus of control. That's right. And that what was coming up for me there was those seem like the right psychological grounds to sow the seeds of socialism too, right? That let everything happen to you. Yeah. The only way to solve it is to, for us to give you something. It's like right. it, it is total abdication of individual responsibility. It's a power move by the intellectual you know, communist elites yeah. or progressive elites, because what they're really saying is you don't have the control. I have the power. I have the power. You're control. So it's a way to take control of people's lives by disempowering them. Yeah. It's very sinister when you think about it. It's actually, it's, it's, it's the worst part of the left yeah. in my view. Now it's not, I don't think it's the only part of the left. There was a different left that was much more about taking responsibility that was um, both at a psychological level, but if you think of the civil rights movement of the 60s, to yeah. the extent it was a liberal movement, right. it said, we shall overcome. Yes. We will do this together. In other words, it said when, the, when they wanted to desegregate the Montgomery bus company, right. they said, we're going to walk to work, right. often right. really far. That's a, or when Gandhi said, we're not going to use British salt we're going to march to the ocean and get the salt, yeah. or we're not going to use British textiles. We're going to make our own clothing. These are movements that were around self-control, self-overcoming, self-reliance. That's the best of the, of the left, the right. best of the human spirit. You know, Joseph Campbell is famous for this idea of the hero's journey story. In the hero's journey story, to become a hero, you are victimized. You are oppressed. Yeah. You overcome your oppression. Yeah. And and the 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 the, the left wing criticism of this idea is that it's blaming the victim. But often the hero does rely on external resources. It does draw on friends and allies. Yeah. But ultimately, to become a hero, you first go dark into this really deep suffering. That's the middle part of that hero's journey. And then you start to overcome it by, remember the hero, the hero's journey, the hero saves the world by first saving himself. That's right. yeah. So when you have a victimhood ideology, it's, it's a complete, there is no journey. There is no journey. You're just a victim and you're a victim by nature of either your identity, which is often quite racist. Yeah. If you're black, you're imagined to be a permanent victim yeah. or, but also if you're have mental illness or you're an addict, you're just a victim and you have no prospects and all we can do is give you clean needles or clean pipes. And even now in Canada, they're literally giving addicts the drugs to maintain their addictions. It's terrible. And it's on the other side of all that giving. One thing I often like to say is the government can't give you anything it hasn't previously taken, right? So it's there's this weird cycle. Yes. Yeah, sort of very problematic. Uh, a poster I saw inside of the art conference here actually had a quote, which I'll try to paraphrase. It said, a hero is someone who understands the responsibility that comes with their freedom. Something like that. So, yes. like, yeah, you, in dealing with the unknown, as Peterson would say, right, you're going to occasionally fall into chaos, right? The dark side of the yes. journey. But it's there that you have to inform yourself, improve yourself save yourself in order to reascend, right? And try right. bring back the lessons to the community or whatever it may be. 
And uh, it seems like that socialist power move sort of undermines the whole thing. Right? That's you just, right. You fall into chaos and you just live there. And in some ways, it's just an intensification of a very natural sympathy. You know, I just saw a, someone I'm friendly with here who, who I said, how are you? And he said, you know, I just got fired from my job. And I, my reaction was, I'm sorry to hear that. And this is a great time to, you know, really dig deep and, and tap into your internal resources and start a new life. He wasn't, I don't think he was quite ready yeah. to hear that. Um, but it is something that you need to hear in those moments. It's something that we have to tell ourselves when something bad happens to us, there's nothing in us that thinks it's a good thing. That's right. But when you, when you live a life, you know, and you look back yes. at the moments, yes. I wrote Apocalypse Never because everything was just, I was losing all my support. I was losing all my funding. Yeah. I was, um, you know, under serious attack. Um, and Apocalypse Never was like one of the things I'm most proud of. Yeah. I would never have written it if I didn't have to write it. If I, that. if I hadn't gone through that pain and suffering. But at the time I wasn't grateful for it. But you look back now and you go, and I think we have to tell ourselves those stories. We have to tell ourselves these stories of overcoming and tapping into these deep internal resources. Or we just end up, yeah, we end up, I think, with a lot of the degeneration and the yeah. victimhood culture that we've cultivated. Yeah, they are true, right? I mean, this is the story of people. It's like overcoming adversity and challenge and the unexpected and yes. over and over and over. It's kind of what we're hardwired to do. And Yes. Um, I, I too wrote my most popular piece at a time of extreme pain for me. Mm. And it's like, it, it's been difficult trying to replicate that. It's like, I'd, well, yeah. I'd like to write that again or something like that, but I can't, I haven't been in the situation. So yeah. it's, it's tricky. It's a tricky situation. No, I mean, I'm experiencing the same thing. Now that you have some, when you have some modest success, you have to ask yourself, how am I going to continue to challenge myself right. and seek the next thing? Yeah. How do I create that adversity in a place of comfort? Yeah. It's extremely difficult. I mean, I think one of the things we, we see this play out, particularly with child rearing, yeah. most parents can continue to support their children after college, yeah. but it's like the worst thing to do for your yeah. kids. You're depriving them of the most important thing, which is adversity. Yeah. You know, it's why so many kids that grew up with a lot of inherited wealth end up so screwed up. Mm -hmm. Their parents deprive. I mean, think of it as a funny way to say it, but their parents deprived them of adversity. That's right. They deprived them of the very thing they needed to develop themselves as full human beings. Yeah, you need the, uh, I guess, touching of reality to really know what you're made of, right? That's you right. To learn about yourself and your faculties and such. And That's if, right. If you have an enabler. Yes. Or a, or a helicopter mom or rescuer. Yeah, the other one, the right? safety net, you know, never lets you get in touch with reality. That's right. One of my highest health priorities is keeping my brain in top shape. To take care of my brain power, I do many things such as striving to read, write, exercise, and meditate daily. One of the latest tools in my brain power toolkit is MindLab Pro. MindLab Pro is a nootropic supplement that is scientifically proven to enhance your brain power. When I take MindLab Pro, my mind feels like it has a better grip on the world, my thinking is more lucid, and the articulation of my speech is much more clear. MindLab Pro has been tested in rigorous, double-blind, placebo-controlled human trials and has been proven to enhance brain power for users in every age group. MindLab Pro is an advanced formulation of 11 nootropic ingredients and is backed by research from 1,473 human trials conducted over a period of 32 years. So if you're looking to start enhancing your brain power, MindLab Pro is an excellent solution. Go to mindlabpro.com slash breedlove to start enhancing your brain power today. Again, that's mindlabpro.com slash breedlove. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, CrowdHealth. CrowdHealth is a Bitcoin-enabled alternative to legacy health insurance. Now let's face it. Legacy health insurance is an absolute scam. Nobody can explain this better than the legendary comedian, Chris Rock. Insurance, you got to have some insurance. You got to, there's an insurance. They shouldn't even call it insurance. They should just call it in case shit. <laughs> like, I give a company some money in case shit happens. <laughs> now, if shit don't happen, shouldn't I get my money back? <laughs> So with CrowdHealth, instead of just paying premiums that you'll never see again, 
you can hold part of this pool of savings in dollars and in Bitcoin through CrowdHealth. And when you have a health event, you can draw against this pool of communal savings. So go to joincrowdhealth.com slash breedlove to learn more or sign up. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Wasabi Wallet. With Wasabi Wallet, you can receive, send, and store Bitcoin privately. In Wasabi Wallet, your transaction history and wallet balance are completely hidden. Wasabi Wallet is easy to use. All of its privacy features are built in by default, and it works with any amount of Bitcoin. Wasabi users can make CoinJoin transactions together with BTC Pay server users or Trezor Suite users. For BTC Pay server users, they can make payments directly inside of a CoinJoin. And for Trezor Suite users, you can make CoinJoins directly on a hardware wallet. These features result in the fee savings and security improvements for both sets of users. So go to wasabiwallet.io today to download the state-of-the-art Bitcoin privacy wallet. Okay, back on drugs, crime, and homelessness, you mentioned that another interesting area to un explore is this difference between homicide and other crimes. Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess in one sense there's a pretty obvious difference. Uh, what, what are you referring to? Well, I mean, I think homicide is this, is a super. I mean, so homicide is the ultimate crime; it's the most serious crime. And the question, one of the questions that that many scholars have asked is, why do homicide rates go up and down? You know, what's behind it? And there's obviously multiple things. I mean, one of them is just how many people are you going to put in jail at any given time? But we saw a big homicide spike in 2020, and there's been a big debate about what that's about. In San Francisco, I side with a group of scholars who say it's really about whether or not you think the government or the society are legitimate. And to go to kind of work out the mentality of it, you know, homicides are often between uh, it's you know disproportionately young men. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's often you know young men killing other young men, and often they're killing young men they know. Um, good police work, by the way, is and it does prevent homicide. You know, the police officer ha knows the names of, I mean, police officers know the boys that are at risk of committing homicide, you know, and so them having a relationship with the kids. Because of prior criminal history, is that? Yeah, prior criminal history and, you know, maybe there's no father in the home. Um, they're, you know, they know who the thugs are, right? And they, and they often, from a very young age, they know who the problematic kids are. But we know good police work, the police officer showing up at the home, having coffee with the mom, saying hi to the kids. That police officer gets in the heads of those boys. Mm -hmm. And the boys, when they're, there's a moment there to maybe you know get vengeance against some other guy that dissed them or flirted with their girlfriends or slept with their other girlfriend or whatever it is, often these are the motivations. They think about that. They think about that. And they think about the police officer having said to them, hey, you've got a future, you know? You know, Jimmy, you can go to community college and you can make a life for yourself. You know, you can, you know, they kind of help them to imagine a future for themselves. And and those boys don't want to let down those police officers or they don't want to be in trouble with the law. And they sort of start to believe in the law. There's a really wonderful book called Why People Obey the Law. Mm -hmm. And what it points out is that, you know, it's true that people obey the law because they don't want to get caught or go to jail. That's true. But there's like... I think we all know, like you can. There's a lot of crimes that can you can commit without getting caught. Mm -hmm. And so then the question is, why do people not commit those crimes? And the reason they don't is because they actually believe it's wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, we actually right, right. agree it's wrong. Moral intuition, something. Like that. Yeah, that's right. Or to kind of go, like, you know, like one profound insight is like, I don't want to commit a crime. You know, not because I'm worried about being caught. And certainly, there's some of that, but also because, like, what would that make me? It would make me a criminal which is a lower form of being, it's a lower form of humanity. I wanna be a, the person because I believe, well, you to, to make that calculation, you actually have to believe that the system is basically fair and that the society is fair and the government fair. So I think this is really important because part of that victimhood ideology is saying, you know, the criminal justice system is racist, the judges are racist, you know, the, the, you know, the, in the, whole, the whole system is racist. Going and telling young men that is basically telling them to go commit crime. It's enabling a criminal mentality 
So I think it's, and this, um, there's one author in particular whose book is on homicide, very liberal guy, by the way, but he says, look at periods in time when people are tearing down statues and the communication is America is a corrupt country, America is a bad country. That correlates very strongly with periods of higher levels of homicide. I think it's very important because mentality is everything. Mentality is everything. And so if the society is communicating to violent young men. Yeah that the society is corrupt, the government is corrupt, you, it encourages the nihilism that is ultimately what's behind decisions to commit homicide. So it's the something like the faith and the possibility of a better future yes. that would prevent people from wanting to engage in criminality in the present? That's right. And I don't want to overstate the ways in which people are making these calculations, sure. but it's some sense. Embodied, yeah. yeah. It's sort of some, like... You just a stewing anger at everything yeah. is just absolutely toxic. It's a recipe for violence and crime. Yeah, the, I mean the the economic connection I was drawing in my mind is like people that are getting squeezed more and more. Right when when wages and productivity diverge, as they did when we went off the gold standard, makes it much harder for Jimmy to have a optimistic future. Right? Yeah, like he can work three jobs and be a absolutely boy, prices just keep going up. So I wonder if there's might be some connection there to explore, right? It's like the the the, the faster the the positive future seems to be moving away from you, the more likely you are to just get desperate and become criminal, perhaps. Hundred percent, and that that's the part of the economic story. I mean, you know, this author, uh, this book on homicide, says that you know during the New Deal, you know, when the, you had a sense the government was on your side, there'd be resources to help you, that work would be rewarded is a period of greater legitimacy in the system. People absolutely have to build, feel like their work is being rewarded. Yeah. I think that's, if I were to suggest, you know, for this conference, when you come to conferences with conservatives, they tend to understand the part about the mentality and, the, and to have the good ethos. They tend to be more suspicious of the thing you were just talking about, which is that the system needs to work for people. Yeah. We saw some of it here, but I think that this is often, you see these disagreements between left and right on this question. And there's no contradiction. You know, one can believe that people need to have the right attitude and you can believe that the society needs to reward work yes. and give people a chance to advance. Both things are needed yeah. to, to do everything we want to do, to have a functioning economy, to have healthy yes. families and to prevent crime. Yeah, if anything, they're in feedback with each other. Right? Absolutely. Yeah, makes, makes total sense. Um, okay, another big topic you touch on in a lot of your work is free speech. That's right. Um, I love this topic. We talk about it a lot. Yeah. I uh, would love to just start with your definition of free speech, what it actually means, um, and then I'll ask you a couple of other questions about it. Yeah. This is not an issue I had thought about very much until a year ago when my friend Barry Weiss, who's an independent journalist, invited me in to join her team as part of the Twitter files. And that was after Elon had taken over Twitter. And so we reported out a set of big stories that showed that both U.S. government demands for censorship, also U.S. government engaged in disinformation campaigns around, for example, the Hunter Biden laptop, mm -hmm. around COVID, around climate change, around a whole set of issues, and of course, occurring Facebook as well. I think one question is, you know, people ask, am I a free speech absolutist? And the answer is no, I'm not. Um, I, I actually... I'm, I've become really enamored with the First Amendment. It seems like an obvious thing, but it's not obvious. So we, we don't allow certain forms of speech. We don't allow fraud. I can't lie to you in order to take your money. Um, we don't allow uh, uh, defamation, though we have a much uh, higher bar for defamation in the United States than they do in Britain. I have a friend here who's being sued for defamation. Absolutely outrageous. Yes, yeah, I have a friend that went through it as well. Yeah, yeah I mean, it impoverishes people. Yeah. And um, and then the other one is immediate incitement to violence. Mm -hmm. We don't allow people to say, you know, go kill that group of people yeah. on the street, go kill them. Right. But what's amazing is that the Supreme Court, in a very famous case, allowed neo-Nazis to march through a neighborhood not only of Jewish people but of Holocaust survivors in 1978. It's the Skogie, Illinois case. It's an amazing case. And I, I, when, I, when I interview people on the street about their attitudes towards free speech, 
I ask people, do you think that the neo-Nazis should be allowed to march through a neighborhood of Holocaust survivors? Basically, everybody says no. You know, your average person on the street, when you ask them to kind of give you an answer quickly anyway, they'll say, they'll say, no, that's horrible that you, that you would allow that. And I tell them, I say, you know, the Supreme Court actually upheld that the neo-Nazis have the right to do that. I think it's really pertinent now because we're seeing pe- many people, including people that I, I love and I'm friends with, calling for things like banning pro-Palestine protests or banning the, the Palestinian flag. Look, if there are Palestinian protesters demanding that Jews be killed right then and there, they should be arrested. I'm not allowed to, to threaten to kill you. That's, that's illegal. It's illegal immediate incitement to violence. But we allow a lot of speech in the United States for pretty hateful things, awful things. And again, I just think this is, um, you know, we have a lot of case law in the United States. Obviously, the First Amendment um, was ratified in 1791. You know, the the founding fathers, they really didn't want to have a United States of America if we didn't have the, the free speech enshrined as the First Amendment. And, you know, for me, it was always sort of something I took for granted. But with the Twitter files and the Facebook files... I've really come to appreciate it and also come to appreciate the ways in which it doesn't mean anything. It literally is just a piece of paper. If the people of the country do not appreciate it and support it and embody it. So, you know, you see a lot of cancel culture and we all kind of saw it going on. But what I think we started to see then is that there's a there's an organic desire to silence other people. I think it comes from a place of privilege. I'm so, pro. you know, you're spoiled you think that you shouldn't have to hear views that make you uncomfortable Mm. well grow up Mm -hmm. you're gonna have to listen to things that you don't agree with including really hateful awful things but you can block people you can filter your social media you can you can turn off the television whatever it might be but you can't stop people from saying those things unless they meet those criteria for illegal speech and then we started to see in the twitter files really this demand you know that the the kind of cancel culture types engaging creating ngos or working at the social media companies and basically bringing that cancel culture into a set of organizations and powerful institutions including the government and that constitutes what we call the censorship industrial complex being funded by taxpayers funded by philanthropists and very sophisticated very invisible to most people we couldn't believe how many organizations there were i mean my my friend and colleague matt taibbi they wrote a report identifying 50 of them, but there was dozens more around the world whose full-time job is basically to lobby the social media companies to censor views that they disagree with. So for me, this has become a primary issue because if we don't have free speech, then we can't take the actions we need to protect people from addiction and homelessness, take actions to protect the natural environment, also to protect our prosperity. We can't have a functioning democracy or free markets without free speech. But even more fundamentally than that, we can't be fully human. Right. You know, like you're, my view is that if you don't have freedom of speech, then you're not, you're not truly a human being. Right. You have to be able to express your ideas, however wrong and stupid they might be. And let's face it, half the time we are wrong and we don't know we're wrong if we can't talk about it. Right. And not only that, but you can't properly counter hateful ideas you can't you must be able to argue with the hateful ideas yeah. so if you censor people from expressing racist right. sexist homophobic other terrible ideas then the risk is that they're actually going to grow in power quietly in the society so for me free speech is absolutely fundamental i'm shocked to discover i shouldn't have been but i'm shocked to discover how under threat it is and so we've made it a huge priority to to campaign for free speech. We ought, we co-authored something called the Westminster Declaration to urge the defunding and dismantling of the censorship industrial complex in the United States and around the world. Uh, you know, it's cliche. You, as you get older, you start to appreciate the cliches, which is that the price of freedom is eternal vigilance. Yeah. And so we're trying to bring to this issue that eternal vigilance. That's fantastic to hear. Um, I like that you brought up a number of things in free speech. One, you talk about fraud, right? You're not allowed to say something to someone that's not true to take their money. Right. I think that's a very important distinction because it actually involves the violation of property, right? Like, yep. It's not illegal to lie to someone, but if you lie to someone to steal their stuff, right? Now it's illegal. That's right. So, so property transfer is very important in this matter. Right. 
The other uh, way I, I don't know who said this, but the purpose of free speech is such that our bot, such that our ideas can go to battle and die, so that our bodies don't have to. Mm. So it's like the way we insulate ourselves from basic animalistic violence, right? Like we can deal with one another yes. rationally. You can resolve disputes. We don't have to kill each other over every sandwich, you know. That's right. With law, things like this. And if you muddy that, you know, you break down definitions or you stop listening to each other or whatever, like you're left with the only alternative, which is raw physical power. What is it then, what's happening in our world today? Like when definitions are under attack, the censorship you mentioned, um, it's a subtle distinction, right? It's like, I think if you really believe in free speech, it's like, I don't have to agree with what you say, but I'll fight for your ability to say it. Absolutely. We need this symmetry of being able to say what we think. That's as, right. As you described. So right. where is this attack coming from and what is the point? Like if it's if it seems like it's of a universal benefit to human beings, why is it under attack and by who? Yeah, I mean, I think it comes from, you know, ultimately comes from rising privilege and coddling. This idea that I shouldn't have to hear these hateful ideas. I shouldn't have to hear these ideas I disagree with. That's a kind of snobbery, you know. Um, I should only hear ideas that make me... We know that having your ideas disconfirmed is dopamine depleting. Yeah. Whereas having your ideas reaffirmed is dopamine enhancing. We feel happier when people tell us that we're right than when people tell us that we're wrong. Um, although, as we know, it's very important to be told that you're wrong. Yeah. Um, so I think it comes from that fundamentally, but then we saw clearly something happening after 2016, which yeah. is, you know, the elect the Brexit and the election of Trump. That was when you started to see this take on a much more scary quality, which was the involvement of the intelligence and security agencies in creating all sorts of pretexts and predicates for censorship. And then COVID made it worse, all sorts of justifications for censoring even accurate information. People that were saying things like, hey, the vaccine isn't going to prevent you from getting sick. It's not going to prevent you from spreading COVID. Those folks were censored. Of course, those are two true facts. So I think it was, it has that sort of, it's obviously it's coming from within us in some bad psychology, but I do think we saw the military industrial complex, security agencies, particularly in the Five Eyes Nations, but also in Brazil, viewing the kind of resurgent nationalism, the MAGA folks in particular, but also radical, some radical left cases, um, but disfavored views in general, that those were viewed as a threat to the established order. And that was where you started to see this really scary involvement of the State Department, of the FBI, of the Department of Homeland Security. It really reached a crescendo with the, when the Department of Homeland Security of the United States in early 2022 announced that it was creating a disinformation governance board which was denounced as a Orwellian ministry of truth. Yeah. Happily, the, the backlash was so strong that they backed away from it. But we haven't completely, we're, we're not, I mean, we're hoping for, a Supreme Court is going to take this case up. We are hoping for a victory in the Supreme Court, but absolutely nothing is assured. What I tell my friends on the right, on the political right, is I, you know, because traditionally free speech is a liberal issue. Yeah. I tell my friends on the political right, you know, make free speech a high priority. Be consistent about it. That means you can't turn around and demand that Palestinian voices are are censored. And then you'll win over, you know, a good quarter to half of the left and you have a strong majority. I'm actually, it's funny because uh, Matt Taibbi, he would always say, and I would echo it, that the left should not embrace censorship because it could be used against them. Mm. And you kind of hear, you know, progressives and Democrats kind of not really taking that seriously. Or being like, oh, that'll never happen. And even I was sort of like, oh, I don't really know if that'll happen anytime soon. Well, here it is happening. You know, we see it happening on the Palestine issue. And I think it's been a wake-up call for some folks on the left to really rethink that whether they want to be on the side of censorship. They're seeing it turned against their own people. Yeah, well said. I mean, if it's happening to anyone, there's the possibility it's going to happen to everyone. That's, That's right. Like, yeah, That's right. Sure. Uh, Michael. Thank you for doing this. Uh, Robert, what a pleasure. Taking the time. Appreciate you. Um, great to meet you in person. Yeah, you too. We talked on Twitter before this. Yeah. This is awesome. Uh, where can people find you on the internet? Best place is uh, you can go to X, formerly known as Twitter, at Schellenberger, or you can find me at public.substack.com. Perfect.
We'll link to that in the show notes. Awesome. Thank you, sir. Thank you.